Okay, um, welcome to today's Monax Voices. Uh, today we're going to be joined with uh, Joe Tanny from Resolution 4 Architecture, somebody who we've been sp speaking with for about two decades now about modular construction. Uh, and before I hand it over to Joe, um, I wanted to make it a bit clear what we really want to get uh, out of Joe's head today, which is really something we've noticed, uh, Ryan and I, uh, in our work with ModX, we've noticed that the value of design is not very clear uh, in the offsite industry in the US. Um, so we've seen manufacturers really focus uh, in the middle of the process, uh, the manufacturing process, so upstream or downstream. Uh, there's a bit of a blame game. Uh, the pro uh, modular manufacturers often come on late to the project, and they often leave before it's complete. Uh, and that's something we've seen uh, as unique to the U.S. market. Uh, globally speaking, we've seen a lot of vertical integration, places like Sweden, places like Japan, where a company uh, essentially owns the entire process. And we've seen new players emerge. Uh, like Katera, uh, even sm smaller players like Benson Wood and their Unity Home products or Connect Homes, uh, where again, we've seen a, a different version of that vertical integration. What we wanted to see today, what we're gonna be learning about today is what uh, Joe and his team at Resolution 4 have developed, which is the mod mod what they call the modern modular approach, in which case really Joe offers his clients in the single family sphere, something very similar to vertical integration uh, without actually owning the process. Uh, and that's something really fascinating that we think is, a, is, a, is, a, is one of the many innovative models that we're seeing in the marketplace today, and we really want to see more of it. And that's why we're going to turn to Joe today to learn a little bit more about what modern, modern modular is uh, and how we can maybe even extrapolate uh, some of those principles uh, into other spheres and into other typologies. So thanks for joining us, Joe. Thanks. Thanks. Good to be here, Ivan. It's good to see you. It's been a while, man. Yeah, let me make you host just so you can, you can rock it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to... Okay going to go do that and then you are host okay. all right so just want to um, give a little bit of background before uh, maybe showing some work or talking about process I just want to talk a little bit about the ideas uh, behind what we do um, you know we're a small office we started in 1990 um, we're typically about 10 to 12 people and as a small office in New York City, we started with, you know, kitchen and bathroom renovations. They evolved into apartments and lofts and brownstones and ultimately sort of ground up, you know, single family homes. But in New York City, you know, the spaces are, are small and the construction costs are high. So working within these constraints, you know, gave us the opportunity to hone our craft, design very efficient, cost effective, idea driven spaces. And then as our as our work expanded outside of the city, it was challenging to find, you know, uh, comparable, affordable, competent, reliable contractors. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we began exploring, like, like many are doing now and many have before us, you know, is it, you know, the, what, is it possible to design a higher quality home for a better value proposition that, you know, within a predictable, you know, time frame? And of course, you know, if anybody can achieve this, you know, we could achieve it. We could design, you know, more homes for more people in more locations, sort of reintroduce the architect into designing, you know, single family domestic space here in America. So we really started thinking about the process, um, focused on efficiencies, you know, the first, the efficiency of design, um, the efficiency of the implementation, and then ultimately the, uh, the efficiency of the performance. Um, and, and so over, as, as I've been said, over these last 18 years or so, we've been developing this process we call the modern module. It's a strategy. Um, it's about creating a system, attempting to fully integrate the design, fabrication, and construction of a single family home. Um, and so I'm gonna sort of start off with just showing some of the ideas. Um, behind sort of this this thinking and it's funny you know Ivan as architects in architecture school we you know I learned about the single family home being you know a focal point and um, you know the exploration of architectural ideas yet you know most people don't live in a home designed by an architect and many many architects over the last 100 years have pursued this holy grail of modernism that is to design a relatively affordable modern home that could be mass produced you know with all they've all achieving varying degrees of success right they they it has not been a sustainable model frank lloyd wright gropius bucky fuller 
Corb, you know, architectural revolution, you know, I think it's important to remember, you know, modernism, you know, as a social movement, as a disruptor to the, to the system. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what these, you know, what these architects have sort of pursued, it's often like a, 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 a this year's model or a model that should be mass produced. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, we stepped outside of this academy, right, and actually then looked inside existing methods of prefabrication. In other words, mm -hmm. if architects from the outside haven't been able to develop a new system to be able to produce this, maybe we should look from the inside of an industry that already exists and see if we could, we could you know, approach from the inside um, and, and maybe be able to participate in this. Um, so we started, you know, we did a deep dive into um, existing methods of, of residential prefabrication. I'm sure as, as you know, and everybody in the network knows, there's basically three tiers, you know, on the, on the low end of the spectrum, if we talk about this umbrella of prefab is the manufactured home, adheres mm -hmm. to HUD, uh, low cost, but low opportunity for improving the design, if you will, given the, mm -hmm. the guidelines that they follow. At the high end of the spectrum, um, sort of call it a kit of parts or a panelized mm -hmm. methodology, mm -hmm. which we've also mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. But we found that um, they're comparable to site building a home if you design it in an efficient way for implementation. They're very, they can be comp comparable in terms of cost. But in the middle of the spectrum, we focused on, uh, you know, modular. They're like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, big Volumetric Legos. Modular, yeah. Volumetric, volumetric modular. Um, you know, it adheres to local codes or large boxes and 80% complete and, you know, truck to the site. And the thing is about, you know, modular, what I'm going to try to talk about to be able to pursue design, we need to fully understand the process by which these things get built. You know, this other idea of, you know, fully integration. So first thing we tried to understand were the limits of the industry. And, you know, there are many but they're also pretty simple. You know, one of the most critical is de determined by the Department of Transportation mm -hmm. in terms of where you can ship down the highway. Mm -hmm. You know, although it varies by state, you know, we found a common denominator of 16 feet wide, 11 feet high. Um, the lengths, you know, vary anywhere from 40 to 75 feet. 60 is the most common. Um, with the module and the reason being it's the physical limitations of the factory themselves in mm -hmm. terms of the structure um yeah, so not then, just dot uh, but com spacing yeah. things like that mm -hmm. right right the actual the actual physical Layout. conditions yeah. yes of, of building the thing mm -hmm. and the, the typical widths you know as you know are 12 14 and and 16. And so for us, again, as a small practice in New York, um, having completed many New York City renovations, you know, specifically long linear loft spaces, <clears throat> we felt, you know, this kindred spirit of working within these limits, you know, this mm -hmm. call it thinking inside the box. It's a natural extension of our practice in designing these, these interiors. So by thinking, by designing from the inside out, we develop these potential layouts that embrace these limits, sort of creating these 16 foot wide linear bars. And we, it's picked up on our loft work, where we call them zones of use. We can try to have multiple uses in a loft because you only have so much space. And we translated this into thinking about modules of use, simply, you know, communal kitchen, dining, living, private bedrooms, bathrooms, and then sort of, accessory, you know, saddlebags, stairs, storage, fireplaces, items that would exceed, you know, the shipping, the shipping uh, limits. And then, you know, while we explored these compositions, these plan configurations, basically, they evolved into seven basic forms or, or types. Um, and each of these types is thought of as a series, you know, capable of mm -hmm. expanding and contracting as needed. You know, the most simple, the most basic of the types is the single bar. If your client's needs are limited, you know, the program can fit in a 60 by 16, then, you know, we could do one module complete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Program expands, simply combine modules. You know, we get a double wide, depending on the site's topography, the program, solar orientation, views, approach, we get a T or an L. Mm -hmm. My favorite is always the Z, <laughs> more compact site, you know, more compact arrangement, you know, we get a triple wide. Mm -hmm. And then 
those seven types are a baseline. So the idea is that we can manipulate these various types and we get this unlimited number of 3D massing mm -hmm. strategies, mm -hmm. all with their corresponding two-dimensional plans, mm -hmm. all based on the conceptual building blocks we call modules of use. I think it's really important to note that um, these are not modules of implementation or mm -hmm. physical building mm -hmm. blocks. Mm -hmm. And as conceptual building, yeah. yes, yes, they, they, they're organizational. They have their own inherent dimensional logic. Mm. And we mm. derive these things from common elements such mm. as, you know, furniture and fixtures and cabinets and appliances, you know, common, common elements with standard dimensions um, for domesticity from which we found these emerging patterns and we use mm. these patterns as as regulating lines to configure these basic components mm. like you know like a bathroom yeah and it's the aggregate of these components that become the modules of use so although the thinking is heavily dependent on dimension it's it's not a prescriptive set of mm -hmm. rules to follow mm -hmm. it's a descriptive mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's the aggregate of these modules of use that become the typologies and it's a customer so interface different... which is also really exciting as well yes. as well as an interface with the industry and that's just a, just as a as a point really exciting yeah. yes we're designing these specifically for each client and to yeah. do so we understand these basic elements and you see here are two diagrams of overlaying these sort of um, sort of sister this way of thinking these regulating lines with mm -hmm. on the left we have standard eight foot sliders and on the right mm -hmm. we have standard six foot sliders so mm -hmm. it's just beginning to think about what are the common elements of building blocks you know to design a home what are the common mm -hmm. elements needed for mm -hmm. domesticity and we literally you know design from the inside out mm -hmm. um, here you know this is a matrix exploring mm -hmm. these 3d you know massing opportunities mm -hmm. and so when they're organized by type you know it's organized by type and size. the seven basic types are vertically along the left and they grow in size as they move from left to right you know by increments of 500 square feet both in one and two story configurations um sort of we this sort of comes from it's analogous to to Corb's panel exercise and mm -hmm. then he sort of sets up a series of rules within which he works within these limits with various mm -hmm. strategies to come up with in theory unlimited numbers of responses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we would we took types I mean again this this was a process of investigation for us over the summer of 2002 I believe Mm -hmm. So these are some further development of the different types. We're just testing fenestrations and roof strategies. Mm -hmm. And then in the fall of 2002, we posted mm -hmm. you know, a website with these, hmm. with these examples, you know, produced from this process, mm -hmm. you know, representing mm -hmm. our concept, mm -hmm. you know, as architects, this is our process, this is our <laughs> concept. Mm -hmm. And they were never intended as models to be purchased. Mm -hmm. But these are examples Proof of concept of, of a system, actually, in a way. Yes, proof of concept. And mm -hmm. so these are, these are examples of what we could do, you know, imagining a um, design system that actually works within the limits of the, of the modular industry. Right. So the intention has always been to leverage the factory by, and design site-specific custom modern homes and leverage their, their method of, of what we think is mass production. So, I mean, honestly, it was a theory. You know, uh -huh. can we actually do this? Here's an idea, here's a strategy, here's the way we, we think about it. Um, and upon posting these things on our website, we immediately started receiving inquiries. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were fortunate to have been uh, invited by Dwell Magazine uh, mm -hmm. to participate in a competition mm -hmm. uh, to design a, you know, a, a modern, what do they call it? They, they consider it a modern, in a prefabricated home that could be mm -hmm. mass produced. Mm -hmm. Had a real client, real site, real budget. Mm -hmm. um, and by that time you had a lot of you by that time you had visited a factory? Uh, oh yeah. 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 By this by this time we had um, we had done research. We had actually been hired by a couple of clients even before being asked by by Dwell because of things on our website and had pursued at least maybe six, six different projects with six different factories by the time none of them were built. Mm -hmm. sure. None of them got too far along. 
and the fortunate thing with the whole you know weight of of the let's say the the spotlight on this competition it provided um it provided more of a of a interest a wave of support if you will mm -hmm. um and so you know winning the competition um it brought a lot of opportunities for us mm -hmm. and and now you know prefab work is sort of a, a real focus of our practice mm -hmm. and we've been fortunate we've designed you know homes from maine to hawaii you know mm -hmm. using modular panelized and hybrid methods of delivery mm -hmm. um and we've been fortunate to create a, a number of projects since then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I wanted to go back a little bit to the Dwell project, if we can, or even to that sure. kind of the synthesis. We spoke to a, a you know an engineer who specializes in kind of helping architects in in, in working through modular projects. Greg Sladitsky, who you know well, sure. Uh, and his, oh, yeah. we asked him at the end of our discussion. It was a great discussion about you know what are some advice for architects. And Joe and I, by the way, for everyone else in the audience, are architects, and that's why we use the word corb. Like Corbusier, who's a French architect, not everyone knows so intimately as we do. We apologize, uh, just as a side note. But Greg, basically, again, who's a mechanical engineer, who's really an incredible, uh, generous, knowledgeable person who's helped a lot of architects yeah. in, their, in their journey yes. to modular. Uh, he said his, his piece of advice to architects, which was a shock, was walk inside a modular factory. Uh, and the reason that he said that, and the reason that I'm asking Joe to explain this process, uh, and uh, is that it's surprising that that doesn't seem to happen very often. So I wanted to ask you, yeah. you know, going back, I know it's, you told us a little bit about the genesis of, of Res4 and Modern Modular, but you know, going back to, I know it's, it's, you know, more than, it's almost 20 years ago. Um, you know, what, uh, what did you think of prefab or as we call it now offsite construction before you walked into a modular factory, even before, you know, you went into this process of, of this kind of uh, developing your own standards? What was your, what were your impressions? And then how did they change in those first few years? Um, so like most people, I think we all thought, you know, it's sort of a silver bullet. Yeah. Um, and you could design something, um, thinking of it as a product and you could sell it to a factory who would then sell it and you could then reap, you know, the benefits or the royalties. Right. Um, I think that was sort of the general perception uh, mm -hmm. we have as architects. Um, and also actually now a lot of, you know, of the mainstream, the public thinks that way too. Mm -hmm. um, but again, when we looked at architects who have participated in this space, it, it did not, it did not work well. And, mm -hmm. and you know, all the examples yeah. and, yeah. and, but like I said, they had limited, limited uh, 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 success. So we started calling factories and, we got a hold of, of somebody who said the exact same thing to us. He's like, wait a minute, you've never been to a factory? <laughs> we're like, oh, we're architects in New York. Um, <laughs> trying to learn about this stuff. Right. And he's like, I have a set out in Long Island next week. Why don't you guys come see this? Mm. So, so you saw a set Rob as a factory before you ever. Well, the, we, we saw a set before you even went into a factory. Yeah. And so when you first see it, you're like, yep, just what we thought. And then you begin to realize, well, wait a minute, there are some nuances here. There's yeah. more to this. There's more to that. It doesn't work this way. This is important. And by meeting some people from the set, we were able to go visit a factory. And from visiting that factory, we we're capable of getting to see other factories. And we visited every factory that would let us in the door. Mm -hmm. um, we met with their engineering department. We found out about the approval process. We under we learned about the uh, 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 the procurement process, the limited vendors that these guys mm -hmm. work with, and why, mm -hmm. so they get the stuff on time and reliable. And the way the way they work with their vendors, it's a it's a real relationship based, um, you know, a, a relationship such that they they know they're going to get their product when they say they're going to ship it. Um, in terms of coming to the factory because they have to receive all the plumbing fixtures and the windows and the countertops Lead and then they assemble it yeah. inside mm -hmm. and if it shows up you know a problem or the wrong thing they can call the guy immediately mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, so that's what led us to the factory um, and from you know working thinking 
and again from our work from having done so much work in the city a lot mm -hmm. of it were cabinets and built-ins where we mm -hmm. tried we had limited time in the in the apartment to work so we would build a lot of the stuff in a shop mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. cabinets <laughs> furniture beds lots of things and it limited the time on site and we got a higher quality it was more efficient and we we're able to 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 accommodate a lot more stuff mm -hmm. so that was sort of a the, the way we were thinking about things um and um learning a little bit about prefab then it took us it took us to this next step and i'm gonna i'll walk you through the process a Great. little bit yeah um, yeah let's talk about just that just the um yeah. the design process and a little bit of the fabrication mm -hmm. um, process mm -hmm. and so really quick in no mm -hmm. detail at all i want to as architects i would just want to say we get hired as architects so a client mm -hmm. approaches us and hires us to design their home mm -hmm. eight out of ten we do are modular sometimes we do panelized sometimes we do site built we respond specifically to the client their site their budget their needs their location you know we're, we're solving a problem we're designing and building a home mm -hmm. um, when we go modular, they're basically broken into, although the architectural services are very similar, there's just mm -hmm. a lot of overlap. But when we go modular, it's basically four phases of four months each. It's divided up where the first phase we do the design and documentation. We decide everything with the client. Um, the next phase is, is the coordination and engineering with the factory. So we spend a lot of time with the factory, getting the approvals, coordinating structure, um, mechanical, we also go out to bid to a local GC because even though you know 80% of the house comes from the factory, we need a local licensed GC to dig a mm -hmm. hole, put in the foundation, make all the connections. And so the way we operate during phase two is we'll send out a bid set to three to five local guys, bring their numbers back, we level them with the mm -hmm. client and to pick the right guy at the right time for the right job at the right price, mm -hmm. um, which then kicks off phase three in that we have a contract with the local gc mm -hmm. who then has a contract with the factory they operate like a big subcontractor mm -hmm. to that gc mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so phase three simultaneously is factory you know they're, they're building the building the house and the gc is on site prepping it mm -hmm. um and then when the, the boxes are ready the foundation's ready they're shipped wrapped up and they're sent to the site um the design process is very similar, right? In terms of a typical uh, strategy architects do in designing a house for a client, we do you know all the due diligence in terms of zoning and codes. We do sketches. But maybe we can stop here for a sec on this slide. One thing that's different, though, right? Uh, compared to conventional, compared to a conventional architect-client relationship, that the sketch in the top left, you are sketching with a client. But your knowledge of schedule cost, uh, well, scheduling cost, let's just say, is very different. I don't want you to normalize this, Joe. <laughs> you know, you, you do this all the time. You make, you make it look easy, but this is not normal, right? If we compare this to conventional single family client relationships, your first three, four hour meeting with the, with the client is different when you're doing modular with, the, with your approach, right? It it, it is. We, we think of it as the same because the same way we get these built within a certain systematic way, we design it the same way in the systematic sure. way. So that's why I'm saying as architects, we'll do modular, we do panelized, we do hybrid, yeah. we do site yeah. built. So you're absolutely right. That the but the mentality... service you're offering is very different. The service you're offering is very different, right? In the sense that you are able to sit with a client and offer a much better sense of what the oh. process is going to look like than you would with conventional construction. So it's not the cost only. Let's whatever the cost is. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's not. But again, that sketch in the top. Yes, many architects understand. You know, they have relationships with contractors when they're working in conventional. You work in conventional as well, right? But with mm -hmm. your with that knowledge, you have the modular industry and with the interface you built. The, let's call it the modern modular. That's what you call it, right? That's that first meeting is a different meeting. I mean, am, am I wrong? We're, we're capable of identifying constraints and goals much quicker. Yes. Yeah. That's a huge, that, well, that, that's a big, that's a big service, right? I mean, well, that's one thing that we've learned um, is our clients, our potential clients are more, most interested in predictability. Sure. In other words, how much is it going to cost? What's it going to look like? How long is it going to take? 
Yeah. So you're right. We're able to sort of dial that in relative to our experience and be able to say, well, your needs are this, your desires are this, your budget is, you know, this, here's a strategy and we'll come up with several options. Right. Um, the tighter the constraints, the more limited one's options are. Right. And so we respond in that, in that manner. And when we go through the process, like you said, that sketch, the drawings, the documents, the renderings, it's all the same. We specify yeah. everything yeah. right down to the, you know, toilet paper holders. You know, and the factory does a big set of shop drawings, the same way you do with a cabinet shop or something, yet it's shop drawings for the entire house. It's a big so cabinet. <laughs> it's a big it's a cabinet. Huge cabinet. It drives down the road. So it's, yep. yeah. Yeah, and so they basically redraw what we've drawn, but within their within their way of thinking. It's only in the last few years have we started uh, have they started integrating BIM in three D models. Yeah. So we would model everything and draw it, and then they would redraw it in their fabrication process. So it's becoming even more fully integrated. We've been working traditional means of integration and coordination. And mm -hmm. the factories, you would think they're a little bit faster in this, but can you go back to that? To come around. Can you start? Can you go back before we even get into the factory? Just a little bit about the process of getting you and your factory partners getting better at the shop drawing process. Can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that feedback loop? How was it at the beginning? How how has been, you know? Don't make you know. I think you're making it look too easy, Joe, and we know it's not. <laughs> Sorry to do that. <laughs> well. In the beginning, yeah, when we tried, when we sent drawings, uh, we had to we had to ship them by FedEx. In right. the very beginning, this was a very long time ago. Uh, f many factories were incapable of importing a digital drawing, mm -hmm. and the reason being is they didn't work with architects. Mm -hmm. You know, their the customer relationship uh, 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 was very different. In other words, typical residential wood frame modular factories or if a client potential they think of it as customers not clients because mm -hmm. they sell a product right and so that's what we do we provide a service and they sell it to a contract process actually not even a client often they're selling to a builder who is who is that's exactly with. right so there's another it's wall a, that you've broken yes yes because the 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 client, the customer goes to the factory and they say, well, we won't sell it to you. We'll only sell it to these to approved the the, builders, yeah. this particular guy in your particular area. So the yeah. client goes back to the builder. I would like the house. He shows them which one would you like, the Roxbury, the Winchester. Right. 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 And they select one and make modifications, sometimes quite a bit, sometimes very little. Right. In the modular industry, they call that custom. As architects, we call that, are you kidding me? Right. But neither custom nor can... standard by the way neither no, neither a system nor but it is what is called custom in the in in the modular industry yes. that, that is true and, we've had a hard time with is, that conversation ourselves yeah yeah but when when you go to a factory and watch how this gets done you begin to see the opportunities for substitution if you will right or you could begin to make these little baby steps forward and and that's kind of what we've been doing all of these years. And I'll, I'll show you a little yeah, bit of that. Sure, actually go ahead. In the, the and sorry, to, sorry to jump in, but no problem. Please do. <laughs> Please do. Um, I just want, I don't, I don't want Ryan to be bummed out that we go like eight hours. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. He'll edit that one out, right? I hope um, not. <laughs> <laughs> but it, as you guys know, you've done excellent research on this. You know, there's 100 to 200 residential wood frame modulars mm -hmm. across across the country you know there's basically an assembly line methodology there's like 15 to 18 stations the boxes move the people stay in the same place i love showing this slide this is the dwell home and the image on the left is the model we built yeah. for the competition yeah. it took us two weeks to build it the, mo the image on the right is the dwell home online in the factory four days wow that's great two They're weeks to four days by, yeah they're both built by hand um, so the efficiency is is pretty amazing in terms of how much they can produce just through organization you know, even without automation yeah yes yeah. just by just by systems organization yeah. mm -hmm. and it's it's not sophisticated but it's incredibly it's efficient and it's smart here you see them building the walls on the top left at the same time they're building the floors on the top right mm -hmm. 
you notice our floor is the one at the top. It has open web joists. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. one toward us is a different project using two by tens. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. over the years, we've been starting to use these open webs because we can run all of our plumbing, all of our electric. Mm -hmm. We can run even our mechanical units uh, uh, systems in there. But then they pick up the walls like big panels and bring them over and set them on on the uh, on the floor deck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you know the assemblies from the inside out. You know, it, uh, it allows the work from the outside in. Mm -hmm. So the panels mm -hmm. quickly become volumes, the boxes move, the people stay in the same place, you know, and they stop at the stations for, you know, um, in, to install the mechanical, the electrical, mm -hmm. the plumbing, insulation, sheathing. Um, you notice this image here, mm -hmm. um, we've developed, we've been working on uh, with a mechanical engineer um, about getting a patent for these linear slots that we use mm. with the high velocity system. So over the years, your project, so within a, within a factory that doesn't necessarily have a standard detail, you are able to introduce certain standard details as dialogue. Yes. Right? Yeah. As, as products that the engineer can actually ship to them all the parts and pieces after doing engineering and coordinating with us. And we give them right. a boom here factory, here's where it goes. And you guys are, I know well aware of the flash and bat we've been, yeah. we've been working yeah. on. Yeah. But then the, um, you know, the cabinets and the counters and the lightings, plumbing, tile. Um, when we started working with factories, we couldn't find one that actually did tile. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then slowly they would, they've embraced it. Um, and again, you can see the, the work is being done on the inside and out at the same time. Um, but the thing is, you know, they're really low tech operations. There are no robots. Mm -hmm. It's all mm -hmm. built by hand. <laughs> yeah. yet very efficient so mm -hmm. good builders or experienced architects you can see a factory you're both blown away and and in both ways how can they build so much in such a short amount of time and how do they build so much with very little automation yeah it's it's pretty impressive um and in two to four mm -hmm. weeks these mm -hmm. boxes are complete mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know and they're wrapped up they're put on a carrier to move out you know, into the yard, if any finishing touches, for example, the image on the top right, the cabinets are there, but Beautiful. the countertops um, haven't been templated yet. Well, actually they've been templated, but they haven't been made yet. <laughs> so they're made by a, an outside shop. They used mm -hmm. to have inside shops of Corian, we'd get them done there and now they sub it out because their mm -hmm. quality wasn't as, as good ah, as, yeah, as a sure. other shop. So. Yeah. But then, you know, they're wrapped up ship to the site following morning a big crane qualified set crew picks them up put them in place modern day barn raising <laughs> you know most common is in concrete you know foundation mm -hmm. uh it's preferred you know below grade but you know sometimes the foundations vary due to design intent mm -hmm. or the soil conditions and the site constraints and again as an architect participating in the entire process yeah we can then work and design foundation such per mm -hmm. this this is a hybrid where it's both you know concrete and steel mm -hmm. wow. um, and the delivery of the boxes you know kicks off the final say phase four so mm -hmm. phase one we design phase two engineering coordination phase three procurement site prep and now phase four the boxes have just been set and now they start doing the structural connections getting the home water tight they're the mm -hmm. highest priorities Wow. And beautiful. then over the next four months, you know, the decking and the siding and yeah. they start all happening on the outside while the mechanical and electrical and plumbing connections are being made on the inside, mm -hmm. you know, and then flooring and appliances are installed. Finished painting is completed. Although it's about six weeks worth of work we found, it typically takes at least 16 to fully complete a house. Let's say it's like 2000 square feet. Some of our, the larger ones with heavy scope, can take longer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, just depending on the scope we we do a lot of you know more than just a, a house mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. um and the the kitchen is is you know often the most you know complex you know requires in most trades the most time often the highest cost so this is where we really learned because in the early years as well we would get cabinets from a different place and a different countertop and 
what we found is the more we can get done in the factory, it's obvious, you know, the, the better the value. And over the years, we've been able to improve. We do all custom cabinets now. We found a shop a couple hours south of the factory, which we develop a relationship with. So mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of, you know, that process of, of you know, integrating design ideas or, or, you know, concepts about a bigger picture, and then understanding the limits of the industry and literally working from the inside out, working of the system, of the, of the industry, as opposed to mm -hmm. trying to bring in a whole new wave from the outside and be a disruptor because this notion of, you know, this, this, this or nurturing notion of, <laughs> or, or, or more of an evolution. Yeah. 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 It's an evolution yeah. that we're trying to bring That's to a point curve. of resolve where yeah. design you know, uh, implementation and then ultimately uh, performance. But for us, you know, building these homes is a literal, literal testing of this theory. Sure. Know? Hypothesis, I would even say, is a better term, you know, than theory. Yeah. If we get yeah. a little bit term, in term, but terminology is important. I think, you know, you had a hypothesis and you, you're open to testing it. A theory is and, actually less flexible than a hypothesis. Yeah, so we're, we're, we continue to test it. And I yeah. don't know if we'll ever, you know, it's a constant, it's still a journey. It's a constant mm -hmm. process. But, you know, if we have time, I'd love to show you how those things have been manifested, a few ideas just to compare yeah. and contrast. In other words, I showed you the diagrams of the thinking. Yeah. Those are our original yeah. diagrams from 20 years ago. And then show you like testing it to see, to see what that, you know, but see if we're, no, I want to. I want to see that. I just want to. I wanted to. I'm going to press you on a couple of things first, just so we make sure, sure that you know we're. You are in this. You've been in this for 20 years. Very few architects have been in it for 20 years. This is why Ryan and I love picking into your brain because you know it's just as people that study this, you know, it's it's a unique thing. There's a lot of people that have very smart people have gotten involved in this and in, in from different fields, but Joe's been in it for a long time, <laughs> and and so we really appreciate that. But you know, one thing I just want to press the point though that. The old model of modular is the client comes to a builder, the builder has a relationship with the factory, or the client comes to a manufacturing and sends to the builder. That is, yes. that is the standard procedure in the industry, and we need to understand yes. it as opposed to a custom built home, conventionally built custom home. Uh, then, we, what we, again, what we've seen, and we've seen it in abroad, and we, uh, so in Japan, you have companies that make very sophisticated homes, 15,000 a year, they hire architects. And those architects give, those architects work for those companies. Those companies are manufacturing companies. Those architects give those clients an experience which is not so different from what you give your clients, except for they work within a, a fully integrated, you know, delivery model. It's very capital intensive, has a lot of overhead, right? And then, the, again, just to make sure this third model, so we have the conventional U.S. model, the, the modular builder, uh, and, and you know, that form of quote unquote customization and standardization. And I wanna come back to those because I think we need to redefine both of those terms and you're doing it. Uh, then we have the vertical integrated model, which is great, but quite expensive. And we're seeing it in certain places. But again, the modern mm -hmm. modular is, I, I, wanna, I, don't, I don't wanna normalize it. I need, we need to know, this is unique. Uh, I think it's very smart in a way. It's maybe typical for what a client would experience for a much more expensive custom built, conventionally built home. Yes. Or even a parts home. But you brought that price point down and you know, we can even maybe quantify that at some point. Uh, and you, you, you've come into, you're offering a very different service and experience. One that's built on predictability, I think, and quality, but predictability, not speed or cost but quality and predictability. That is what the Japanese sell modular for with, by the way, which is interesting. And you've done that by placing yourself and providing a service that says, I will be the person you interact with. I will interact because I, 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 have, this, I have a humble understanding of the modular industry. We work together. I work with the manufacturer. I work with the builder. And I also control a supply chain that is much larger than what modular manufacturers are willing to offer. And so I just want to step back because that is not typical, Joe. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a very unique model. And the fact that you don't actually own any of those pieces is really impressive. Yeah. Right? So you've well, tied together. This is what, you know, Katera yeah. is, says it's a technology company. We love Katera. They're great. It's a different scale. If you, get, we don't, you know, if you gave Joe $2 billion, who knows what he would do with it. Uh, but, you know, they've done a great thing with a bigger, you know, big, bigger money in some ways. The good ideas are actually this, very similar. Their platform. Yeah are similar to your yeah. modern modular, 
but you're doing it in a way that is lean and mean, man. So don't say it's normal. You know, there's nothing normal about it at all. No, but it's, it's also, so anyway, and then maybe one thing before too, so that, I just want to clarify that. And the other thing is maybe you can just say something about it. The way you talk about the modern, the modular industry, the respect you show for it is not typical among us, uh, our colleagues, architects. When we walk into a modular factory in the U.S., we ask for the robots. The robots aren't there. We leave. Can you just say something about where does that humility come from? Where does that, <laughs> no, seriously, I, I, you know, because that's well, a big step of your success. I, I mean, or, or, or the way the modern modular approach is built on a humility of walking into that factory and saying, you know what, there's no robots, but there's some smart things going on. Like that is not. Yeah, the humility I, I have to sort of give to my partner, Robert Luntz. Okay, um, okay. I will, I will tell you when we first, you know, these, a lot of these factories, well, that's the other thing that we've talked about. You know, if there's 200 factories across the country, the majority of them exist in the Northeast, and there right. they were predominantly in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Things have changed a lot since 2008, but we, back when in 2002, when we were visiting factories, um, began to quickly learn it's a different culture. Mm -hmm. And that these factories, they, they operate because you know, they don't need architects. They don't necessarily mm -hmm. want architects. They have mm -hmm. a product, they sell a product, they got a thing, they work with builders. Why do they want it, the headache of an architect coming in here to tell them what to do and how to build their thing and design their thing? So the more factories we went to and began to try to have that humble dialogue just to get in the door and to be able to go sit in the plants, right, and listen, um, you know, a lot of it had to do with college football relating to the, the various that culture. Uh, yeah. 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 Various your photo, people. The photo of your buildings is next to the Pope at Simplex, for example. That, that's what I'm talking about <laughs> culture and humility. And, you yeah. know, sorry, just, to, just, you know, whichever Pope it was, so, I don't remember. But anyway. <laughs> well, it, it's important as architects, if we want to build more, we need to know more about how things get built. Yeah. And the more you learn and you realize most architects, especially young ones, we don't, we don't get a chance to build a lot. Yeah. And that's why in New York City as young architects, we were fortunate to have built a lot of interiors. So we tried to leverage that knowledge and see if we could apply it and learn as much as we could about things that we don't know. And we yeah. still do it to this day on a job site. We like to work with best in class and learn from people. Um, so I, I think that's, that's important. And again, you, it's interesting because we don't sell the boxes. I think that's one of the big differences because um, even people overseas, that design element that's woven in, they're selling you a product. Yeah, yeah. So that's a little bit where- You're selling a we're, process, I mean, an experience in, in a way too. And yes, both too. yes. At the end of the day, it's hard not to see it as a product because it's a home and you, someone's paying money for it and living in it. I understand that. But to get to that product, we are, you know, we, we talk about this idea of mass customization. We're trying, to, we're trying to design something specific and unique to a specific set of conditions by using methods of mass production. Yeah, so why don't you, I'd love to, yeah, so maybe we have a little bit of time left, but maybe, you know, one of the things that you, you keep talking about is learning from doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, mm -hmm. so maybe sharing, you know, maybe as a way to wrap this up, and I know you have some things to share sure. with us. Some some I, of the big I lessons, do. yeah. Well, or I, even going through. I, would, I mean, through the project. Let's say observations. Let's say observations. I mean, I'm I'm just going to show a few right. um, awesome. sort of compare and contrast a few things, and this is in response to, you know, often as well in in the world prefab, we architects we come up with these big ideas and these nice fancy renderings and and a, this nice object that we that we think should be sold again and again, but Again, designing from the inside, um, you know, the kitchen's big part of our work. You know, mm -hmm. it's often the mm -hmm. focal point. Um, like I mentioned before, it's got, you know, um, quite a, most of the expensive stuff that goes into the house. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of wanted to point out that, you know, over the years, on a variety of them, thinking of the kitchen as the command center, you know, the life re revolves around the island. And this particular image is very similar to the dwell home and very similar to a number of projects where we have a long linear 16 foot bar and we cross it and this sort of cardodecimonis, if you will, is the kitchen itself. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're able to get an eight foot island with three foot 
paths on both sides and pack out the edges with cabinets. Mm -hmm. And so this is within the dimension of a 16 foot box with one going across the other way. Mm -hmm. You know, here's an example, mm -hmm. similar strategy, yet the boxes are turned 90 degrees. In other words, this is a 20 foot span mm -hmm. that we're able to put the boxes side by side by side, as opposed to a long linear and that allows us to get a wider uh, communal space. And over the years, we sort of went from 16 foot max span with these guys to 20 feet with a flitch play. And now we're able to do them, we're building them now at 24 feet. So we've been able to improve just the structural aspects. Here's another one, very, very similar, right? But just they're different relative to the client's needs and what the interests are and the overall layout. And then often, you know, we have a, this fireplace volume that plays off of the kitchen, you know, so the kitchen is a focal point, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright talked about the hearth mm -hmm. being the center of the mm -hmm. home, we think of the kitchen island, but it often plays off of the, of the fireplace volume, mm -hmm. sort of creating this, you know, kitchen dining living in these, these uh, communal spaces. But they vary, you know, they're, they're not always exactly the same. You know, the one on the top left, they're eight foot high sliders, nine foot high ceilings. The one on the right are windows at eight feet. The one on the bottom right are windows at nine. And the one on the bottom left are sliders at nine. So it may not seem like a big deal, but in the beginning, we, we, they couldn't source nine foot high sliders. They just didn't have the relationships with people. So over the years, it's been little teeny baby steps of, of improvement. Um, where sometimes, you know, the fireplace moves off to the side or now we're, you know, putting on site, we're doing, you know, stone and brick uh, and another, you know, a, a range of things, you know, sometimes um, we try to get maximum glass mm -hmm. and we try to design the steel out of the homes, not so much because of cost, but just because of the logistics, because it mm -hmm. often slows down the line space. Mm -hmm. Or if you have steel on one side and not the other, it sort of offsets the shipping in terms mm -hmm. of asymmetrical weight. So and this is primarily deals, wood systems, right? something to think about. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, the, yeah, primarily yeah. wood systems. So yeah. introducing steel is a, is a logistical challenge, even if it's possible, yeah. Yes, yes. And for example, this one, we had a moment frame at the end mm -hmm. because we, were, we blew the lid mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. thing. Here's an example I just want to show of these mm -hmm. two where they're both at the top of a stair. You know, one of them has a butterfly roof on top. One of them's just flat. Right. You know, one of them has standard Anderson windows. You know, one of them has storefront windows from uh, Arcadia. Mm -hmm. You know, one has a soffit where we're running down the mechanical system right there. Mm -hmm. You know, and the other one has just radiant heat and no, no AC at all. So they both go out onto a deck that's to the left, mm -hmm. you know, and they have a similar relationship in terms of being in an office or a media room. So it's sort of an idea that we have in these spaces to begin to develop a number of things. But again, they vary within that zone. You know, uh, home offices, I think, are quite popular now. We often have yeah. them, these different materials. We custom design them and build them. We get out of the factory what we can, and the other we supplement on site what they're not capable of doing. Mm -hmm. But over the years, we've been really fortunate. All this millwork we're getting done in the factory now. Mm -hmm. So like I said, we're being able to, move, to improve the, the quality more and more, and therefore, you know, we're able to do even more custom built mm -hmm. things with mm -hmm. beds and couches mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know a variety of things where 10 years ago we, we couldn't we couldn't do that um mm -hmm. you notice evolution the soffit, yeah evolution you know the linear slots we have up here for the ac mm -hmm. now we're starting to to incorporate but you know they they again they vary not mm -hmm. one is the exact same yeah. thing it's not a product but it's a response mm -hmm. of how we begin to organize these things you know, the bathrooms are often very simple, you know, they're just big enough. But I think one of the big things I want to point out then as architects, mm -hmm. we don't simply think about the design of the inside in a number mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, details, but mm -hmm. also on the outside, we've developed a series of standards. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're different and that translates to the awnings and the briselets and the screen porches and the outdoor showers storage shed so it's not just a house it's a it's a design of understanding yeah. how everything is organized and comes an together environment. but only yeah. the environment it's a home yeah um and we're 
we leverage the factory for what they do well, which are these volumes. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of this woodwork we do not do. You can see here is an example of a saddlebag being mm -hmm. put on the side of this house. This accom accommodates a stair that goes up. It's an mm -hmm. upside down house. It's very similar to this one in the Catskills. Mm -hmm. Yet this is out on the beach. Mm -hmm. It's a two story home. The communal's upstairs. Here are the communal's downstairs. It's in the woods in the Catskills. So you can see the way the deck wraps it. You know, very similar in terms of the saddle bag, but different organization just because the boxes slip over one and the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. this is infill. just a yeah. simple, yeah, infill in the Bronx, you yeah. know, that's a tear down. A lot of our work is tear down. Mm -hmm. Now it's raised because of FEMA. It's sloped because of the New York City uh, zoning ordinances that was mm -hmm. built with panels. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a site specific response. Mm -hmm. You know, another one uh, with FEMA and strict zoning mm -hmm. restrictions. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a two story double wide. This is, you know, an L mm -hmm. or a Z and a hybrid Z, you know, yeah. and we get lots of roof decks and a variety of, of hybrid wow. types that allows us to, you know, respond to multi-generational homes. This one was on an island. We had designed the boxes 14 feet wide to get on the ferry to get over to the, to the island. We also had a prefabricated foundation on here. Yeah. And because it was so remote, you know, and this one's very remote. It's on a mountain in Vermont. It's so remote, it was cheaper to go completely off the grid. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, a, it's powered by a solar panels. So we'll use, you know, <laughs> solar panels yeah. and geo, yeah, to show the, the durability of yeah. the, uh, in the snow. Yeah. And all of them are designed to lead standards. Yeah. Um, and we often try to tie together the geothermal and the solar when we can, you know, and make little we've done about half a dozen now that produce more energy than they actually consume. consume. Yeah. And that would be a, a goal uh, to be able to, you know, in terms of response to this idea of performance, but yeah, now we're able to get led lighting and, wow. and uh, dimming Gorgeous. systems and low plumbing fixtures and high performance windows and the high velocity, uh, you know, uh, hydro air system, often mm -hmm. radiant heat. They're all engineered, you know, for specific snow loads. They mm -hmm. often have heat generating fireplaces. They're engineered for the solar gain as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they're engineered to handle, you know, the hurricane winds. This one got hit by Sandy and survived while the house next door got, you know, destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the boxy forms, they come from uh, the reflective of the limitations of the process by which right. they're made. So some counties allow for higher shipping. You know, mm -hmm. um, the butterfly roof, two 16 foot wide boxes. This was in, uh, in Wisconsin and allows us to get much taller, yeah. uh, taller yeah. heights in this thing. And, and this one, we're even able to get the, the wood ceiling done in the factory. That's not wow. always possible. You know, the butterfly roof here was built as a module. And that's a custom module. You, that's in a way a detail you've developed in collaboration with factories yourself, right? Through this interactive process. Yeah, it's, it's not unlike what they do, it's just different. So that's yeah. the thing is when we understand how they put things together and do it a little bit differently, it's still of their ilk. It's still yeah. what they do well. We're not pushing mm -hmm. them too far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and times we have, um, sometimes we lift them up, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes, you know, we're not only parking underneath it, but mm -hmm. we get a screen porch and storage. Love the shot where it shows Oof, the day of great. the set, yeah. and then how it's finished. You can see how simple the framing yeah. is below. Sometimes yeah. it's more complex because of the structural conditions. Sure, like this one, sure. where we had to put it in a steel frame on grade beams. Uh -huh. You know, we have to lift it up here though because of the FEMA, but mm -hmm. we did because the site was so narrow. So right. now we can park under it, play under it. We get a right. wood shop under there to create right. shade. So we double the amount of, you know, horizontal surface, you know, to use on the bay, uh -huh. you know, and thresholds are important to our work. You know, it's a, it's, it's the sense of arrival here. It frames the garden beyond and the views to the pool house back there. Yeah. Sometimes we drive right through them, you know, and actually have it not only entry for to the garden, but entry for the car and the entry to the house. Nice. Sometimes there's, there's no cars, but it sets up this notion of a procession through a great 
it's, you know, through a gate into the courtyard mm. to this compression and it sort of frames the garden yeah. beyond, you know, or, you know, these distant views. So this idea of that box is we try to make the space, right? We try right. to articulate the space so it's not merely um, an object. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. So he'll probably edit, but should I keep going, Ivan? I know. Why don't we? I, no, I think this is good. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, maybe this is a good point to kind of wrap up a little bit. Uh, I think sure. it's, yeah. It, yeah. No, I mean, I think, well, anyway, it's been, uh, it's really interesting to see. I was going to, let me just see if, um, while we're at it. So do you think, well, one of the, one of the, oh, this is great too. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, unfortunately, I don't know if we have time to get into that. That's right. We'll do it another time. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, we'll do it. Yeah. Um, but just, just so you know, these are the ones we did yeah, yeah. for the. I know, I know. Uh, it's lines. great. Yeah. Yeah. We can come back. I mean, you know, we can do another. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we've gone too long. <laughs> yeah. No, we can do a whole. Uh, yeah. There's a whole series here. Um, I don't know how you want to end it then. Why don't we, yeah, why don't you, it's okay. Just, why don't you just pull out of the, the share screen and I was going to, I'm just going to ask you one question to sort of uh, maybe wrap it up and then we can, uh, we can sure. shift a little bit, but it's, it's pretty great. Um, no, so I mean, I just wanted to, you know, I think one of the things that, so Joe, well, thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, it's really, uh, it's really important because as much as, as architects, we take for granted the value of design. And as you've learned in the modular industry, uh, you know, design is something that's seen often as a hassle uh, or it's seen as a, I mean, architects, not design, architects are often seen as a hassle. It's certainly architects, yeah. it's not just that architects don't want to go into the factory. It's that factories often find architects to be, uh, to log up the, the sort of smooth operation of, of their production. Yeah, right. So, you know, maybe in, just thinking about in general, like what are some things that we can do as architects, uh, but also that the modular industry can do to get more value out of design? As, as an industry. Uh. So I, I think one of the important things if architects want to participate in this space, mm -hmm. um, within the space that exists without reinventing it, mm -hmm. we need to learn what works about it and what mm -hmm. doesn't work about it. Um, I think there's a lot of things that are efficient and mm -hmm. smart, but a lot of it uh, can be improved. Mm -hmm. But as architects, we don't really know how to participate in that, I think, mm -hmm. until we, we do a little uh, a little more research and a little more learning, right. which I think what you guys are doing is really spreading the word and it pro provides an opportunity for people to to uh, to learn more. You know, it's interesting. Um, it was the AIA guide, guide to, to, modular. to modular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when it came out. You know, I just looked at it briefly, thinking, of course, this is obvious. You know, superficial. Yeah. But I reread it recently. And I'm struck how important in there what it, what, what it says. And again, at the time when I first read it, when it first came out, it was obvious to me how critical it is that architects, you make the decision up front with your client yeah. if you're going to yeah. build in this methodology or not or this methodology. Not down the road. Yeah. 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 And I think that's a big mistake. Um, and I think that's part of frustration between, let's say, a fabricator or a fulfillment mm -hmm. partner or right. let's just say a factory, let's say a wood frame, simpleton right. uh, modular factory, right. is that we often architects go in there thinking they can build this for us and we hand them a sketch. And that's what's right. really turned right. over the years, turned factories off to architects. Right. And right. I think that's also why we haven't gotten a lot of traction in the industry. Although we've seen you that know, from the industry too, Joe, you know, to be fair, it's a two, it's a two edged sword to be, you know, tough love to the industry is the industry also tells people they can build anything and they can. I know. And so, think, you know, and so that's, that's why, part of, that's why I want to, you know, I think we can give advice to, so you've given some advice to architects. What would you say to the industry? How do but, you work with but, architects better and why? But I, I guess what I'm trying to say, that's yeah. the culture. That's, yeah. that's the, that's the difference as architects. We have certain expectations. Right. And what factories do, they just make a product. Right. They're not providing a service to us. And right. so that's why the big disconnect is. Right. So in terms of, you know, telling a factory, you say you can build anything, that's because they don't understand. They, they don't understand what yeah. anything is to architects. <laughs> or they, the, cli or the customers, clients either, in a way. It's, it's a very limited, narrow. 
but mm -hmm. we sort of played off of that right. where they can say we could do anything. And then we just took little baby steps, moving right. that, moving right. the boundary, right. pushing the ends of the uh, envelope, sometimes too far. And yeah. we'd pull back. Um, so yeah. I, I think yeah. it's important um, in, in any, any, I think any group that sort of tries to like start new, there's huge learning curves that could yeah. be, that can already be seen within the industry itself right now. I just think there's a, a, a huge opportunity for improvement. But we need dialogue. That's what I, that's what I'm seeing. I mean, you're, you're a walking example of really, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And that's, I mean, that's why maybe it needs to scale. Uh, I think there's really need for dialogue because we, we're not seeing it. We're actually, there's some big investment and there's 200 factories that are doing the same thing. And there's one, you know, there's a few, there maybe one, maybe a few other approaches. We've seen a few other architects try to develop something similar, although I still think modern modular has gone a long way through researching not just the modular industry, but the way we live. Um, so I think those are, you know, and, and it's somewhat obvious. Again, we see it, Katero's uh, multifamily kind of kits, honestly, are the closest thing Ryan and I have seen to what you've done. And it's a lot of people in that office. You know, yeah. so uh, yeah. so there's a big gap anyway. And I th but I think making it making a real clarifying what the value of design and, and also clarifying what it means to customize. I think we use the term mass customization very loosely. Usually, usually for architects, it somehow has to do with robots again. I don't know why. It doesn't have a lot to do with clients and how they feel. Uh, and architecture is about feeling as well as about efficiencies. So the idea that you walk, your clients seem to walk away feeling an imprint on the building whether you know whether it's there or not whatever you know it's not about picking from sure. a catalog it's about that memory yeah. of sitting down with you and being heard and you understanding that process and that's a very different understanding of customization that exists you know among architects and that exists in the industry in the modular industry frankly so anyway i think there's a lot more to learn i'm gonna what we're gonna do joe because there's so much to learn and we really you know you have so much experience we're definitely gonna keep talking with you hopefully yeah. we really appreciate forward to it. Uh, really appreciate taking time with us. This is this is really rich stuff, and um, and we're going to be back. And one of the things we're going to start doing is, uh, and you know, this is for the ModX audience, but also for Joe, is that we we are doing a real deep dive into into these ModX voices, we're calling them. And then we're going to start putting voices together. Uh, so whether it's going to be a manufacturer and an architect, two architects, a policy person, an architect, or a, or somebody even from an advocacy point of view. Once we build this knowledge base. We're looking forward to having Joe back uh, and others, and then let's let's hash out some of these best practices and let's see where we can how we can move this forward. So thanks again, Joe. I look forward to it. Okay, thank Great. you, Ivan.